mentioned in the very first lecture that photography is what we consider a relatively new medium in fine art. Its history, compared to drawing, painting, sculpture, and ceramic arts, is a young one. It's only been in existence since the mid-1800s, compared to the other media that have existed since the dawn of humanity as we know it. When we look at the history of photography, it's important to understand that its evolution has paralleled that of an industrializing Western world, and so the ways that the practice of taking pictures has evolved echo major developments in Western history. Photography was invented just before the Industrial Revolution in Europe and America. As the science of photography advanced and pictures became easier to take with the invention of portable cameras and celluloid film, so too did Western industrialization. And as the world began to experience side effects and problems of industrialization, overcrowding in cities and urban areas, mass migration, extreme poverty and disease, and the rise of organized labor, journalists and reform-minded individuals and organizations had a tool to witness and record these side effects, and social documentary photography was born as a distinct type of photography. At the beginning of the 20th century, we see social documentary photography firmly established as a practice, and it characterized by a set of visual conventions that set it apart from other more artistic or painterly approaches that I talked about in the first lecture. Black and white prints, uncontrolled natural lighting, and an informal composition. The simple goal of documentary photography is to testify to the existence of social fact or human condition, to make a record of humanity as it is in reality, however painful that reality may be. But if we look at the history of social documentary photography, we see that often the goals were a little bit more complex. Early social documentary photographers were not only artists, but reformers as well, aiming to document the ills of industrializing urban life in order to raise awareness among more comfortable middle classes who were often insulated from these problems, and against the robber baron, gilded age, upper class elites, whose domination over U.S. economic policies and practices since the Civil War, they argued, created these social ills in the first place. Some of you, if you think about U.S. history classes you've taken in the past, may recall the terms yellow journalism and muckrakers, terms for the journalists and activists who illuminated corruption and exploitation of large companies during this time period. One such muckraker who became a grandfather of sorts of social documentary photography was Jacob Rees. Rees became famous for publishing How the Other Half Lives in 1890. Rees was born in Denmark, arrived in the U.S. in 1870, and began work as a journalist in 1877 after failing to find steady work. He was a beat reporter for the New York Tribune, covering the tenements, large, crowded, low-income apartment buildings which were often squalid and neglected by owner landlords, and social reform organizations, which had started to gain popularity by this point. In 1877, he began using photography to dramatize and publicize some of the situation he encountered as a reporter. He gave series of illustrated lectures and published How the Other Half Lives in order to connect his audiences, which were often upper and middle class, to the terrible living conditions he saw in New York. In fact, he often tailored the content of his lectures to specific audiences in order to maximize that effect. His efforts brought social documentary photography into the popular culture and allowed various progressive reform organizations to realize the value in the added realism of a photograph, as opposed to an engraving or a woodcut, which were the traditional modes of illustration in mass media. These organizations, in turn, began to create departments of public relations that hired or retained documentary photographers to help in their activist efforts. Lawrence Feiler was an important progressive reformer in New York at the turn of the century. He served as the chief officer of the Tenement House Committee, and recognizing the power of photographs as tools of social reform, he curated the Tenement House exhibition in 1900. Feiler's objective was to change the public housing laws in New York, known then as the City of Living Death, so he saw the Tenement House exhibition as an opportunity to promote those objectives by using photographs to publicize certain social causes of poverty. It worked. His work led to major changes in New York City's zoning laws and eventually sent him to D.C. to work for the Hoover administration. Another organization to tap into the power of social documentary photography in order to promote progressive reform was the National Child Labor Committee. 
In 1908, the NCLC tapped photographer Lewis Hine to head its photography department. Hine had made a name for himself in 1907 as a photographer for the Russell Sage Foundation, which had taken on a massive survey of social life and working conditions called the Pittsburgh Survey. For that survey, he photographed life in the steelmaking districts of Pittsburgh. Prior to working for the Pittsburgh Survey, Hine had taught at the Ethical Culture School in New York, where he advocated that photography was an educational medium. There, he would take his students to shoot pictures of immigrants arriving at Ellis Island. He developed what would later be known as the documentary style, a new approach to photographing human subjects that didn't exploit the subject, but rather allowed for the expression of their individual human qualities and idiosyncrasies in a natural and tender way. He brought humanism to documentary photography. For the NCLC, Hind ph photographed and documented child labor, particularly in the clothing mills of North Carolina, in order to help the NCLC's lobbying efforts to make child labor illegal. Hines' work for the NCLC was often dangerous. He encountered violence among the foremen and managers of the mills who didn't want images of the terrible working conditions to seep out into the public consciousness and jeopardize the industry. When World War I broke out, Hines took pictures for the American Red Cross in Europe. Hines' work really articulated the idea of an American vernacular, or photographic language that documented how real working-class Americans lived day to day, and this idea became extremely important during the Great Depression when the Roosevelt administration needed to build up support for his New Deal economic policies. In 1935, Roosevelt created the Resettlement Administration, a New Deal program aimed at providing aid to rural farmers and victims of the Dust Bowl drought by resettling them into green belts and suburbs and improving the camps of migrant workers who'd fled drought-stricken areas to California. This program was controversial and deemed socialist by some, so the program's head, Rex Tugwell, commissioned Roy Stryker to head up an RA documentary photography project. The goal of the RA Photography Project was to publicize both rural distress and government efforts to alleviate it. Stryker hired several photographers who we now know to be famous and live on as exemplars of documentary photographers. With the efforts of these photographers in the 1930s, the photograph became the central symbol of modern communication. Artists included in the project were Walker Evans, Arthur Rothstein, Carl Maidans, Ben Shawn, Dorothea Lang, Russell Lee, Jack Delano, John Vashon, Marion Post Walcott, and John Collier. The first RA Photography Project images to appear outside a go government publication were in Survey Graphic Magazine in 1936 and illustrated articles about sharecroppers in the American South. By the end of 1936, RA photos were featured in Time, Fortune, Today, Nation's Business, and Literary Digest magazines. In 1937, Life magazine published an RA spread. The RA was folded into the FSA, or Farm Security Administration, in 1937, and FSA photos appeared in many publications, including the New York Times, Look and Life magazines. As these documentary images were gaining popularity throughout the United States, image magazines like Look and Life grew in popularity as well. These magazines would become extremely important during World War II and its aftermath, in that brief post-war era before television became widely accessible and popular, for giving people the news, in pictures, of a world in tumult. During World War II, the FSA Photography Project transferred to the Office of War Information, or OWI. Once under that umbrella, the purpose of the project shifted to directly helping the war effort. Roy Stryker resigned in 1943 to work in the private sector, ending the golden age of the FSA for photography. But the vast collection left behind and housed in the Library of Congress illustrates how photography was used to unite government, corporations, and cultural institutions. The Second World War was documented on a huge scale by thousands of photographers and artists who created millions of pictures. American military photographers from all branches of the armed services covered all of the battlefronts around the world, depicting every activity of the war, and federal war agencies produced pictures on subjects from war production, rationing, and civilian relocation. Just as the photographers for the RA Photography Project became famous and noteworthy in the, Euro in the U.S. during the Great Depression, 
Many civilian photographers from the U.S. and across Europe, who either freelanced or who were employed by publications like Life and Look, made names for themselves covering the onslaught of war and its aftermath. Margaret Burke White, who worked for Life, was the first female war correspondent. Robert Kappa, a Hungarian photojournalist, was the only civilian photographer to land at Omaha Beach on D-Day, and he was later awarded the Medal of Freedom in 1947. Alfred Eisenstadt, a German-born life staffer, and W. Eugene Smith, an American photojournalist also working for life, also recorded now iconic images of the conflict and the human victims of it. In the aftermath of the war, the role of documentary photographers was questioned and redefined in two ways, and this split is exemplified in two major post-war happenings. The Family of Man exhibition, curated by Edward Steichen at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and the creation of Magnum Photos, an independent, freelance, documentary photojournalist cooperative. If you remember from your first lectures, Edward Steichen was a pioneer of American photography. In 1942, he became the head of photography at the Museum of Modern Art. There, he put on several exhibitions in the 1940s meant to illustrate photography's chief natural functions of documentarians and human interest recording. His Road to Victory exhibition of 1942 was a large-scale, interactive exhibition that had viewers move through the images in a narrative progression. It emphasized faces of men and women who constituted the basic strength of the country, and his intention was to allow viewers to easily identify with the subjects and feel part of the power of America. Under Steichen's lead, MoMA became a minor war contractor, operating closely with U.S. efforts to promote and use American art and photography as pro-Western anti-Soviet propaganda. In 1955, amidst high Cold War tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union, and a fear of communism's seepage into American culture, Steichen put on the Family of Man exhibition. The Family of Man exhibition illustrated the gamut of life from birth to death. Steichen's goal was to draw attention to the universality of human experience and the role of photography in its documentation. The exhibition, designed by Paul Rudolph, premiered in New York and then moved to major cities in the United States and on to 37 countries on six continents. It featured 273 photographers, 163 of which were American and 70 of which were European, and it promoted a largely Western-focused perspective on human experience. The exhibition was sponsored by the U.S. Information Agency and was intended to counter Soviet claims that the U.S. lacked culture and refinement in fine arts. While it got criticized criticism for being glorified U.S. propaganda, overly humanistic and neglecting issues of race and class that have always troubled this country, it was crucial to the history of documentary photography because it proved photography had earned its place at the fine arts table. The exhibition was a blockbuster on the world stage and it proved the public acceptance and embrace of photography as art and entertainment. It also raised important questions about the purpose and truth of documentary photography and how much control editors and curators had as opposed to the photographers themselves over the narrative behind the photographs. World War II photographer Robert Kappa raised such questions at the war's end and founded Magnum Photos in order to reflect the independent natures as artist photographers as they reported and documented post-war life around the world. In 1947, Kappa, along with Henri Cartier-Bresson, George Roger, and David Chim Seymour, founded the agency as a freelance cooperative. The idea was that magazines could purchase images the photographers owned instead of the other way around. The thinking was that unencumbered by editorial rules they were subjected to as paid magazine staff, these photographers were freer to seek out the truth of the human condition across the globe. And with the advent of more portable cameras, they were largely able to do so. In fact, Cartier-Bresson, who we've seen before, went on to a thriving mid-century career, seeking out what he termed the decisive moment where the significance of a moment combines with an exact organization of forms that captures that moment. And we will talk about this more when we talk about street photography. After the war and in the early 1950s, the promise of documentary photography seemed limitless. 
but the invention of an even newer medium, television, threw the world a major curveball. In the next lecture, we'll look at social documentary photography since the 1960s and see just how much of an impact television has had on the practice.